Glory's coming. Ghost, Hallelujah. It's happening to me now. Ghost, you walk around saying that every day. It's happened to me now. Well, it doesn't look like it. Well, Ghost, tough. I don't care what it looks like. You're supposed to be a believer, not a doubter. You're at the wrong church if you want to be a doubter. We're a believing church. We believe that God is doing things right now. Supernaturally, more than what we can do ourselves. You guys are going to get it today. Hallelujah. Because I was praying about a completely different message. <laughs> and now you're going to get this one. Hallelujah. I hope you're ready. I know you're ready. You know, glory be to God. Because that's what I say. Are they ready for that, God? He said, just shut up and tell them what I tell you to tell them. I don't know, does God talk to you that way? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I don't know if that's the exact word, but that's the way it comes across to me. You know, we, I, I think so, shut, shut up used to be one of those words you get slapped by your mother for saying. But it seems to be more current today. It's more powerful, you know, than, oh, please be quiet. <laughs> Just shut your yap. <laughs> Goodness. Glory be to God forever. Hallelujah. Well, I'm excited. God is doing supernatural things. Supernaturally. And that's why you can't be looking to the natural. If you're going to look to the natural for all your sources of supply, you're going to miss it every time. Because it doesn't come from there. It doesn't come from the natural. Everything God does is supernatural so He can get the credit. If we could work it out in the natural, then who would get the credit? You would, or I would, or I don't know. It wouldn't be God though, right? There's a difference between the work of your hands and the work of God's hands. Bigger hand, more power, right? He said to me the other day in one of my many rebukes that I seem to collect, I should write them all down. I could call it the book of rebukes. <laughs> I had a prophecy that I just kind of shortened up because I didn't want to go that far. Ever do that? No, not me. I never do that. I never cut God off. And I sit back down and he goes, is my finger shortened? Looking at me, is my finger shortened? And I'm like, I guess it is. You know, God talks about the hand of the Lord or the arm being shortened. Well, he called me a finger and said, is my finger shortened? <laughs> uh -huh. So I had to repent and say, okay, I'll really attempt next time to say exactly what you tell me and not shorten it. How about that? So you're going to get some of it today. <laughs> oh, glory be to God forever. Enoch. Anybody ever heard of Enoch? If you haven't, you're in for a treat. Enoch is a wild dude, my friend. Still is. Notice I said is a wild dude. He's, he's not dead. <laughs> if he showed up in church this morning, we'd have a lot of questions, I'm sure. But he could do that because he's not dead. He was not. For God took him. All right, lest I get ahead of myself, let's pray before we get into this. Oh, Jesus is Lord. You guys going to believe with me? You're going to believe and pull because there's stuff here that I want to get out. And if we can get it out, guess what happens? It becomes ours. The secret things belong to the Lord God, but the things that are revealed become ours. That's why it's important to press into the glory. Keep pressing in. Well, I've had enough. No, keep pressing in until you can't take it anymore. That's what he said would happen when you tithe. The, op the windows of heaven would be open to you to the point where you can't take it anymore. You can't receive it all. Are you there yet? We're going to be, though, because we're going to keep pushing in. We're going to have to hire people to help us give away all our money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who's it? You ever see those uh, TV ads with the cell phone? You know about it. 
<laughs> what is, can you hear me now? They don't do that one anymore, do they? Do something else where they just show up. A guy shows up. He's out in the field. I said, I thought you were supposed to come here by yourself. You know, and he said, I am by myself. Well, then who's that? He goes, oh, that's my network. Right? And there's helicopters and buses and trucks and linemen and all these people. There's like a thousand people right behind him. That's our people. They're with us. We have angels that are specifically designed to do nothing but work financially. Did you know that? Won't you want a couple of them hanging around you? <laughs> oh, glory be to God. I hope you're ready. All right, so pull and believe today, not tomorrow. Well, I'm going to believe that tomorrow we have great revelation. No, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day God can put something in you and you'll go, huh, well, I don't have to worry about that anymore. You ever had that happen to you? I've had it happen to me. Time and time and time and time and time and time again, worried about something and all of a sudden something just drops on me and I know, well, that's taken care of. How? I don't know, but it's taken care of. That can happen today. I don't care what your problem is, where you are. Whom? God can, God's your answer. All he's got to do is sit on you in that, that way that you need and wham, you got your answer. It's always the same answer. God. <laughs> I knew that. Why was I looking for anything else? All right. Glory be to God forever. So I'm going to encourage you again. Believe right now that when we pray, we receive. Re Picture yourself. You can do this. Picture yourself reaching your hand into the glory and grabbing something out. Remember grab bags? You ever see a grab bag? You don't know what you're going to get, but everything in there is good. There's no snakes and, you know, weird things in the grab bag. Like there might be, you know, at somebody's house when they have a grab bag. You don't know what's in there. It's not a bear trap that you're going to put your hand into and snaps and clips your arm off. You're not going to lose anything. Whatever God has for you is probably the thing you need right then. Did you know that? He has a supernatural way for every time you reach into the glory, you're pulling out exactly what you need. How does that happen? He must be God. <laughs> he is God. I don't know what you need, but God does. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, we were going to pray, right? Yes. All right. Glory to God. Father, in Jesus' name, I believe I receive right now from your glory and from your word. Father, we approach your word with reverence. We approach your word with fear and trembling. And we ask to enter into the glory and the revelatory realm of your spirit that we may receive from you anew today. Things that we may have heard before, things that we may not have heard before, but we are coming into you today to receive from your glory truth deposits and impartations into our life and spirit. And we will never be the same when we give you the glory and the praise today for all of it in Jesus' name. I ask you to uh, help me to speak your words and help people to hear from you today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Shoo, hallelujah. Well, if you, uh, did I put a statement up there? Yes. Enoch, the last day church. Oh, well, brother, why would you say that? That sounds a little strange. Well, because I believe that Enoch is a type of the last day church. And this will take a little bit to get this all out, but bear with me. What would that mean for you? If you're the last day church, what does that mean for you? That's right. That means you're like Enoch and you're going to be taken like him. Now turn with me quickly over to uh, Isaiah chapter 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God, there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel will stand and I will do all my pleasure. The top of verse 10 says declaring the end from the beginning. He says, I am God. This is the way I do it. Declaring the end from the beginning. See that? So how's going to do it? God going to do it right from the beginning. He's going to declare what it's going to be like at the end. Does that make sense? 
Why does he tell you to de- declare the way you want it to be rather than the way that it may look? You have to be like God and declare what the end is to be right from the beginning. That's why the best thing someone who has sickness in their body is to say, I am healed. I was healed by the stripes of Jesus. They're declaring the end from the beginning. Does that make sense? That's how you're like God. That's how you line yourself up with God. All right. Go with me to Jude. How many of you know that Jude is really way towards the end of the Bible? Did you know that? Well, now you do. Right before the book of Revelation, there's this little book called Jude. Hallelujah. And in that book of Jude, in verse 14, it says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam. What does that mean? The seventh generation from Adam. Do you remember Adam? Where was he? Was he at the end? Or was he at the beginning? He was at the beginning. So seven generations. Adam had children. They had children. Do we have to go through this whole thing? We'll get it, right? Then Enoch, he was the seventh from Adam. I would call that the beginning, right? That's pretty much the beginning. God declares the end from the beginning. He's God. How can he do that? Because he's God. He knows the end. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things. What do we know the first thing about Enoch? He's a prophet. Right? Bear with me on this. Saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Now look here. How could Enoch prophesy about the Lord coming with ten thousand of his saints? Nobody even knew there were saints at that point nor the Lord coming with 10,000 of them. There weren't 10,000 people yet, were there? There were just... Maybe there were. I don't know, unless they bred like rabbits or something. (laughs) But he says the Lord's going to come with 10,000s of His saints. He saw this at the beginning. Now, you're going to have to grab onto this because Enoch was not just a prophet with words. He prophesied with his life with his living, his his act, his act, whole being and the way he lived was prophetic. You ever heard of that? There's several prophets that did that. Some of them God told them to strip naked and lay down in the street and lay on their left side and do strange things. They didn't actually say anything. They just did something which was prophesying what was to come. So this isn't unusual. This is one of the ways God does stuff. So Enoch is saying is is the end from the beginning. Something happened in Enoch's life which is going to prophesy the way the end will be. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's continue on here. Next scripture. Let's go back to the beginning. Do you realize, and this gets really simple, do you realize where you are in your Bible? That's the end. Now we're going to go back to the beginning. Go to the book of Genesis. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. Glory be to God forever. Hallelujah. And, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God. If you don't have those verses, uh, underline it. Enoch walked with God. After he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Something I would like you to see right here is that Enoch walked with God for a long time. Enoch, the one we're talking about, who is a type of the end, he had something to do with what happened to him. He walked with God. And this gets really thick. And actually, I even printed out some of these notes for you, but I'm not going to give them to you now because then you'll just stick your nose in it and you won't pay attention. You'll be looking at your notes. 
But I give the I printed out some some words here and stuff that you can take home with you and study, okay? Because we may just stay on this topic for a little while. That's how strongly I believe in this. What do you believe in? I believe in this. <laughs> Glory to God. This is not something I just came up with over the weekend. Some of you who know me have heard me talk about similar things as this for quite a while. This is big. This is what's going to happen to you. Yeah, it's going to happen. Well, brother, I don't know if it's going to happen to me. I'm telling you, it's going to happen to you. All right. Enoch walked with God after, you know, there was only two people that God said he walked with God, that walked with God, two people. Noah and Enoch. Noah was actually related to Enoch. Enoch was his grandfather, I believe. No. Two, two generations passed and, and Noah appeared. Glory be to God. Enoch walked with God. Verse 22, after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Well, brother, what you're talking about, I don't know if I can do this and still live in the earth. This is what I want you to see here. Enoch begat sons and daughters. How many of you know that's a time-consuming thing? Do you know that that, you know, when you have a baby? They, they, they like, uh, they, they occupy you a little bit, don't they? They do. How can I do, and I've heard this before, how can I do live this extreme kind of glory-filled life that you're talking about and still be a part of the earth? Enoch was a type of it. He walked with God. And we'll see as we go on, and it wasn't just one time where Enoch was zapped out of his body and he was gone. And all his kids, what happened to Enoch? No. He would go in the glory and come back. He'd go in the glory and come back. He'd go in the glory and come back. And then all of a sudden, one day, when it was time, he went in the glory and didn't come back. Well, what does that have to do with us? I'm telling you, he was a type of the last day church. We're going to go into the glory. And we may have to go work our job. And then we're going to go into the glory. Maybe for a longer period of time, God will reveal things to you, impart things to you. And then you're going to come back and do something else. You can live your life with the glory on you and around you all the time. And then one day, which is not up to us, it has something to do with us, because if we're not in the glory, God can't do it. But the time is not up to us. But when that time comes, we'll be in the glory and we'll just keep going. Well, what about the tribulation? I don't care. Tribulate all you want, brother. (laughs) It can tribulate, but this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the glorious church, the church being in the glory and living there, of whom Enoch is a type. You're starting to see this a little bit. Enoch walked with God. So I bet you figured this out by now. We're going to talk about walking with God. What's it take to walk with God? How can we walk with God? What does it mean to walk with God? Because there's two people that talked about walking with God, Enoch and Noah. (laughs) And it said it twice about Enoch. Does that mean anything in the Bible? Yes, everything means something in the Bible. Goodness, what if it said Rich Stewart, he walked with God, and it never didn't say it about anybody else, just him and Noah. Would you put some emphasis on that? There must be something there. Oh, there's a huge amount there. God's declaring the end from the beginning with his life. Hallelujah. (laughs) Your life is going to be a fulfillment of the prophecy of Enoch's life. Why don't you get in line with it? Glory be to God forever. Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. Everybody say 300 years. And begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And it says it again. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Now this is part of the paper that I'm going to hand out to you. After the service. Enoch. Look up the name Enoch and see what it means. I don't know if I should even try to pronounce these things. Kanak. It means initiated. Number one meaning of the word is initiated. Enoch. 
How many of you names names meant something, especially back then? They mean things now, but back then it meant a lot. When God named somebody something or their father prophesied over them and then gave them their name, it meant something. Well, Enoch means initiated. The second root word is to narrow, to initiate, narrow, or discipline. Enoch was disciplined. And this is where it gets rough on you. <laughs> if you're going to live and fulfill the prophetic life of Enoch, the prophetic life of Enoch, you fulfilling it, you're going to have to be disciplined and narrow. Does that mean slender? No, that means narrow. You ever have everybody call you narrow-minded? Well, you got to pray over your meal every time you eat it. Yeah, because i got to eat it. That's why I'm praying over it. <laughs> if you got that, or <laughs> especially you go out to eat, you better pray over that thing that somebody just put on in front of you. you got to eat it. Disciplined. Enoch was disciplined and narrow in his thinking. Narrow-minded. Well, what do you mean? Shouldn't we all be broad-minded and fully embracing the cosmos? <laughs> No, narrow-minded. How are we going to be narrow-minded? Jesus said it's a narrow way. You think Jesus was narrow-minded? People would have called him narrow-minded. Oh, son of God this, son of God that. <laughs> but he's the son of God, you know? You can be narrow-minded when you're right. Right? Are you ready for this next one? Dedicate to train up. Enoch, he was dedicated. He was trained up. Remember last week I had to say what? Up is good, down is bad. He was trained up. He was dedicated. He was narrow-minded. He was going in one direction to go up. He was being trained. Where was he being trained? And if anybody reads the book of Enoch, get yourself a copy. It's a wild ride. <laughs> I'm not calling it scripture. It's one of those things that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? But you read it, and it's quoted word for word in the book, what we just read in Jude. One of the first chapters of the book of Enoch was quoted word for word in the book of Jude, the Bible. So at least that one paragraph is Scripture. But in that book, it talks about Enoch going into the Spirit and doing work. Anybody ever feel like they went and did some work in the Spirit? And then came back and made supper. Or didn't make supper, whatever case it may be. If you're fasting then, you probably didn't make supper. But you did work in the Spirit, and then he came back, and he raised children for 300 years. He was being disciplined, trained, and becoming more narrow, fulfilling what he was. Do you know people, when they gave him a name, they didn't fulfill what they were called to fulfill until they fulfilled it? <laughs> Abraham, God changed his name, said, this is what you're going to be. Father of many nations, calling the end from the beginning. And then it took him years until he actually become that, became that. Same with Enoch. God said, this is your name. This is what you're going to be. Disciplined and narrow. <laughs> Wait till you get the next verse. You think that's extreme. The next definition from the root words. Dedicate and train up. He was being trained. To be narrow, by implication to throttle or to choke oneself to death by as if by a rope. <laughs> How do you apply that to me, brother? <laughs> oh, it gets good. Think about this. Discipline to the point of choking one's to self, oneself to death by rope. To hang yourself. To live the death of self. He was walking in the life of God. He had to decrease in himself to the point where God was living through him. He no longer lived for himself. What do you think a disciple does? What did Jesus say? Take up your cross and follow me. Well, I don't want to pray in tongues for three hours today. But I told you to. Here's your rope. You get to die daily. Do you see that? 
This is Enoch. Hey, you, you came here this morning. That door's not locked. Is it? Go lock it. No. <laughs> to die to self, to discipline, to train, to go up. The death of self, Rich. It's all written all over the name Enoch. And I'll give you the paper after the service, and you can read it for yourself. I didn't make this stuff up. I wish I did. <laughs> to throttle yourself <laughs> and to choke oneself. What are you choking? You're choking yourself. You're choking your self-will, your self-desire. Why? So you can be disciplined to go in his direction. Just like Jesus had to go to the cross and he sweat blood. He didn't want to do it, but he said, not your will. I mean, not my will, but your will be done. This is the discipline. You're like, oh, great. What did I get myself into? Yeah, but it's good. You look at Enoch. He was not because he walked with God. Guess where the change has to take place? If you're going to walk with somebody, I think I might have that up there. It's a little di different service here this morning, but that's okay, right? Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. You might want to hold your uh, place there and flip with me over to Amos chapter 3, if you can find it. It's one of those wee little books. Amos chapter 3. And I'm going to show you how you can throttle yourself. <laughs> That's what we should call this message. To hang oneself. To death as if with a rope. <laughs> what was your message when you went to church this morning, Julia? He told us how to hang ourselves with a rope. The church of the living dead. <laughs> oh, brother. Just when I thought it couldn't get any more radical, Angie, we had to go and do this. Amos, chapter 3, I'll show you. This is not just weirdness. This is the Word of God. I'm not the one who said you got to die daily. I'm not the one who said you got to take up your cross. Why did he say your cross? That means you must have a cross to carry. Who do you think's going to go on that cross? Your cross. Somebody else? Alan, please, this cross is heavy, man. Do you take care of that for me? Say, no, I just happen to notice you got your own cross over there, don't you, huh? We've all got these crosses we have to carry, and guess who goes on the cross? We do. Yay! You, know, you ever see those, uh, you know, from, from the Catholic churches? They've got Jesus on the cross. They got that all wrong. He's not on the cross anymore. We should make little crosses with ourself on it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? With your own little picture and face on there. And they go, look at that. Jesus looks an awful lot like you. <laughs> oh, glory. <laughs> Yay. But guess what? You don't even have to stay on the cross forever. You die to self. We're, we, we're buried with Christ. What? We're raised to a new life. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's the old man on that cross. Your old life. The old ridiculous one. Now you've got a new life that comes from him. And this is what Enoch was prophesying with his life, with his name. He walked with God. If you're going to walk with God, what is it going to take? That's what we're going to talk about. What about you walking with God? Number one, you've got to die to yourself. That's it. That's it for you. Kiss you goodbye. We shall have a funeral services for you. But I'm not dead. Well, you're going to be. <laughs> Let's read this. Hallelujah. Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can they? You ever try to run a bag race? You know, a three-legged race? Bag races are worse because you got to hop. That never ends up good. But if you try a three-legged race is when you're walking with somebody and you tie your outer leg to theirs and then you try to run a race. You better have some communication going on between you, maybe some counting or something, so that you're in agreement so that you can go. We're going to step with our left foot first. But you got to be in agreement. 
You can't walk together unless you are agreed. What did it say that Enoch did? He walked with God to the degree where he was not for God took him. Who do you think had to change in that instance? What's what we've been preaching on here for, I don't know, till I'm blue in the face. Who gets to change? We do. You do. I do. Two walk together except they be agreed. Well, God's already got the plan. We got to just agree with him. Does that make sense? So if Enoch walked with God, who had to change? What did he do for those 300 years of walking with God? The Bible says he was disciplined. He became narrower. He became more trained until he was like a man hung by a rope. You know, you give enough, somebody enough rope, they'll eventually hang themselves. You ever heard that? I'm giving you enough rope. <laughs> Here's some more rope. Do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, brother, it sounds like, you know, I can't just go say what I want to say anymore. What happened to me? What happened to you? You want to walk in this way? You want to walk in this glory, this power, this what we've been talking about? Are you willing to pay this type of price? This is the price I'm telling you Enoch paid. He was not for God took him. He paid the disciplined price. He pray, paid the narrow price. It's narrow when you start having to say only what God says about you. Speak only His words about you. That's narrow. It's like walking a tight... You ever walk a tight rope? <laughs> Nobody raised their hand. <laughs> but we all know what that means, right? You don't just dance around on that thing, walk any way you want, eating pizza. You would fall off into the pit of alligators. If there was one, we've talked about going higher and higher, how you don't mess around when you get higher up on that. Remember the electric line. You don't mess around. The higher you get, it gets more dangerous. It gets narrower. What about Enoch? God starts taking him up, taking him into the glory, right? He didn't just go up one. He went up many times and he was getting disciplined and trained. Why? To stay there longer, to function there more profoundly and better. And we know that. We're finding out there is stuff in the glory that we've never even seen before. And we're being trained. We're being disciplined to walk with God. All right, people. Jesus is Lord. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Flip over to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. By faith, who? Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Well, brother, I just said, uh, you just said that he killed himself. No, I didn't say he killed himself with a rope. I said, that is what his name says. He, he struggled. Okay, I'm going to give you a really graphic illustration. Kids, pay attention. <laughs> If you were to hang somebody by a rope, they would struggle. They used to do this, didn't they? It probably wasn't very many years ago where, you know, you would have public executions. <laughs> Brother, what are you talking about? <laughs> public executions. Hanging yourself by a rope is a struggling thing. They don't just die. They don't just, whoop. It's not a merciful way of doing it. It is a way of killing somebody. <laughs> Do you understand there's a struggle? You try to get out of the rope. Do you want to do that to yourself? Do you see this? There's things you don't want, the prices you don't want to pay, but it is worth it in the long run. There may be a struggle. God tells you to pray in tongues for two hours. Well, about an hour and a half, it becomes a struggle. Unless you're really in the glory and you forget about time, which usually is what happens, you know. But there may be times when you're struggling to get by that. You could be struggling to get past that third day of fasting. You see what I'm saying? What is your flesh doing? It's kicking. Imagine the picture again. <laughs> your flesh is not enjoying it. But the real you, the spirit man, is. That's the part of you that's you. 
So we get to crucify the flesh and the affections and lusts thereof and seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of the throne of God. Is this making sense? And then eventually your flesh gets quickened. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Before the church gets translated, we are going to have this testimony that we please God. How did, how did Enoch get translated? By faith. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So at some point, God is going, we're going to hear him saying, come into the cloud. Come into the cloud. Have you been hearing him say it? We're being called into this glory, called into this cloud. Where's he going to speak to you from? The same cloud. He's talking to you when he faith comes by hearing him speak to you. Am I losing everybody here? <laughs> Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. How many times did Jesus say, you won't be caught unaware? You're not going to be caught unaware of these things. He's going to speak it to you. But you will be unaware if you're not paying the price. You're not throttling yourself. You're not putting to death that flesh. You're not living the life that Enoch prophesied. Right? Right? Glory be to God forever. He had this testimony that he pleased God. <clears throat> Let me uh, give you this word walked now. Remember, Enoch walked with God. Halak. I know I didn't pronounce it right. I don't speak these words. <laughs> Unless it's in tongues, I might have said them before. I don't know. This means to walk, to behave oneself, to be convers conversant continually and then it goes on to say it means to depart and enter to depart and enter he walked with god he departed and he entered this was a continual thing over 300 years to exercise oneself the bible says we're to exercise ourselves towards godliness discipline narrowness Glory be to God. To get, to go forward, to go out abroad among. He walked with God among what? God. Here's another thing. Enoch walked with God. The word is Elohim. What is that? That's the plural form of God. Everybody was scared to put gods in there because it would freak everybody out. But think about how God presents himself to you in more than one thing. He presents himself to you in that book, the Bible. It's God speaking to you. Narrow yourself towards it. Discipline yourself towards it. He presents himself to you in the person of the Holy Ghost. Discipline yourself towards him. Narrow yourself towards him. Crucify yourself to anything else. The blood of Jesus... Apply. You see what I'm saying? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. All of these things that we've been given, it also applies many times in the Bible, Elohim, to angels. So this is saying that Enoch was disciplined towards living and walking in this realm. This place where the glory is. This place where God reveals himself in all of these capacities in his word by angels. Let me ask you a question. An angel comes up, shows up in your bedroom and says, this is what God's saying to you. What do you leave the room saying? This is what God said to me. But wasn't it an angel saying to you? Yeah, but he came from heaven with a message for me. This is what he's talking about. When the Spirit of God comes on you to prophesy. What is that? That's a manifestation of God on you and around you. Do you understand that? He's walking with this realm of God. You could almost say it that way. It kind of affects your head better. And you're disciplining yourself to walk in that realm. 
Hang with me, people. I know I'm throwing just crazy stuff. But this is, you know, I have struggled with this last night. Because I was like, maybe I need to just n- tighten things up a little bit here, slow down, kind of maybe go back some word of faith stuff and some other stuff. And God says, no, go. We don't have time to just walk around and go back through it. Let's preach on love. And believe me, I believe in love. <laughs> okay? But we don't have time in this end day church to just keep going over and over and over stuff. It's going to take people who have disciplined themselves and trained themselves to enter in and stay. Some people want to leave and they want, when it gets too hot, they just leave. Don't be one of them. Stay. Stay put. Stay in the glory. And you'll see farther out beyond. And you'll take the next step. And the next step on one of these days, the next step is going to be see you later. But we'll be ready because we'll be disciplined, we'll be trained, and we'll know what's going on. Well, there's the angel with the golden trumpet. Oh, he's lifting it up to his mouth. Hey, get ready. I'm ready. Let's go. Right? How would you even know that that was going on? Because you're there. You've trained yourself to be there. You're training yourself to live in this realm where all things are possible to him that believes. You're a believer. It's your home. This is where you're supposed to live in the world of Elohim, where all things are God. Everything in heaven is just says God all over it. Carlene was talking about, you know, noticing the breath of God in animals. How much more in heaven? It's all God. God, 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 Elohim. This is where we are to live and move and have our being. All right. Glory to God. You guys are starting to get it. Hallelujah. How do you know you're starting to get it? Because I feel releases. Sometimes I just bash things over the head until all of a sudden everybody goes, oh, yeah, I'll get that. Fine, then I go on to the next thing. (laughs) So get it faster and I won't have to spit on anybody. (laughs) All right, glory be to God forever. Hallelujah. He had this testimony that he pleased God. Okay, we're just going to keep going here. Go with me to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. And you're going to see this a little bit differently than maybe you've seen it before. Enoch walked with God. Enoch, who was disciplined to the point of strangling himself to walk with God. He went in. He went out. Speedily. My favorite part of this uh, definition here is to be at the point. To walk with God. To be at the point. Have you ever been at the point of something? The point of breaking? The point of... Well, you can think about flying, for instance. There's a point when that airplane is at the right speed and it's got the right amount of wind going off over the wings. It's at the point of takeoff. It's right at the point. This is what he's talking about. Walking with God. You're at the point of takeoff at any given minute. That's what the five virgins were. They were ready. Jesus said, be ready. Because when the trumpet goes, you're at the point of takeoff. You got to discipline yourself to be there. And it's discipline to keep an airplane right there. You got to keep it at that point of takeoff. You don't want to take off, but you... Does that make sense? You're at the point. You're always at the point of what? Hearing God. God tells you to give, you give. God tells you to speak, you speak. And you don't shorten his finger. You say what he says. You discipline yourself to be in that glory continually, all the time. Even on the job, you're at the point. doesn't take much. Just push your button and all of a sudden you're in the spirit. I'll give you an illustration of Kenneth Hagin. Remember Kenneth Hagin at all? He's gone on to be with the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> I remember we used to pray with him every day and, you know, people that worked in the ministry there. And you could just see him. Sometimes, you know, he would pray and he'd get down and he'd pray in tongues and pray in tongues and pray in tongues. I remember one time watching him and it just profoundly affected my thinking. When I just saw he wasn't praying and then he was just kind of speaking to people and all of a sudden he said, okay, Lord. And he went, he took like two steps. He went, frango, brezele, beble. And you could tell he had just stepped into another world. He, start, he turned around, he started talking to the chair as if there was a man sitting there. And we're all going, oh, wow. 
But it didn't take him, my point is, it didn't take him three hours of praying in the Spirit to get there. He was at the point. Do you get the point? He's at the point. (laughs) Continually ready just to step over. Right? Somebody calls you up, I need you to come pray for sister so-and-so. She's got a, a hemorrhage or something. Are you at the point to just step over and pray? Always there. Always ready. Disciplined. Narrow. Well, why won't you go with us to uh, such and such a movie and hang out in Chuck E. Cheese or, you know, whatever. And I'm not saying those things are wrong. But there's a discipline that you have to maintain to be ready, to be in that spirit all the time. God may be saying, hey, I got a project for you. Norval Hayes, good at illustration. He was coming back from, you know, Norval. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've talked about Norval before. Anyways, Norval Hayes driving home from... Uh, He was going to go to Thanksgiving with his family. That's not always pleasant. (laughs) Do you know that? It's it's usually a big opportunity to, to get into a bunch of stuff. Right? God said, I don't want you to go and eat turkey. I want you to go hand out tracks on, uh, Daytona Beach. Thanksgiving. He said, there's drug addicts down there that I want to reach. God, it's Thanksgiving. What's mom going to say? What's everybody going to think? They think I'm nuts already. Now they, you want me to go and hand out tracks instead of eat turkey with them. Well, what do you think Norval did? After belly aching and moaning, he took out his rope. He hung that flesh that wanted to go eat turkey. And he went down and handed out tracks. People got saved. It turned into a big revival. A bunch of drug addicts and stuff just getting delivered. And on his way home, he's driving back home now from Daytona Beach in his car, just driving along, worshiping God. Thank you, God, that I didn't have to go eat turkey. And God speaks to him and says, property, just driving through property. He says, "Okay, property. What does that mean? He pulls over the car and he he calls up somebody and finds out that his property right here is for sale. He bought the whole mountain, sold it the next day for like a million something. Because God, do you see what I'm saying? He throttled himself. He disciplined himself to do what God wanted to do. And then God paid him back. A lot more than, you know, what it cost him in tracks and gas, I'm sure. Do you see that? There's a benefit to doing what God tells you to do. I don't know. Take that for whatever it's worth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To walk with God, to run, to be at the point. To walk up, to and fro, up and down to places. (laughs) That's what walk means. People used to use that all the time. Walking with the Lord. Well, now we know a little bit more what that means. Actually, walking, you want to walk with God? This is where I was going to first go. Maybe we'll go there. What is God? He's a spirit. Where does he live? He lives in the spirit world. And you're going to walk with him where you're going to have to live. I just had this happen to me the other day. It hadn't happened until since maybe 20 years ago when I was at Rama, Walking back and forth in my living room, praying in tongues. Praying in tongues, praying in tongues, praying in tongues. And all of a sudden I had that realization again come over me that that is the real me. That's the real me. The other thing, the ugly mug you see, is not the real me. The real me is that inner man. Who's walking with God, right? So you're walking with God. It doesn't mean you're just holding hands like this, walking down the street with God. It means you're doing it in the spirit, in his world. You get to change. We get to change and come into his world and learn and change and learn and discipline ourselves and learn. And it gets better all the time. It's getting better and better. You wish you had two people to hang. <laughs> now don't take that too far. Glory be to God forever. Are we there in Matthew? Bear with me a second here. We're getting there. I didn't come up with 45 scriptures this morning. Just 35. <laughs> no. Matthew chapter 17. And after six days... Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings 
them up into a high mountain apart. He brings them up. After six days, you know, people that get into this prophecy stuff, I don't know, talk to Rich about it, maybe he knows more about it. I don't, I don't study it out to the degree where I can, you know, enumerate time as in how it is. And, but what I'm telling you is we're called up. We're going up. You get that? Yeah. So you can have what other theological whatever you want. But we're going up. That's the point. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother. Why did he take Peter, James, and John, his brother, and not the other of the twelve disciples? They were close. They were his friends. They were the closest ones to him. So they got to experience something else that nobody else did. Well, that's not fair. Well, tough. <laughs> No, nobody said the Bible, you know, it's going to be fair. God is not a communist. He's not. He doesn't just spread it evenly among everybody. No, he gives you the choice. They, they were hanging out with Jesus. They were his best friend. You have a choice. And what I'm saying this morning is you've got a choice. It said he throttled himself. He disciplined himself. Why? So that he could walk with God. Do you want to walk with God? This is what I'm saying. You want to be the end time last day church that is a fulfillment of Enoch's prophecy? This is what he's prophesied. That people who lived like him disciplined themselves to get in the spirit and stay there and learn. And put to death the mortal body stuff. And pick up the glory and learn and walk. These are the people that were going to be caught up and taken away. Hee ha 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 ha. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brings them up into a high mountain, apart, and was what? Transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Where did they come from? Well, brother, they were hiding up there on the mountain. They were really old, and they were hiding up there in tents. People think that wacky stuff. They were in the spirit. They were in the glory. They were in the Elohim. Did I say they're God? No, but they're in that which is of God. Why did the animals think that Adam was, was the ruler of the earth at the time? Because he looked just like God. He had the glory of God on him. It's not your glory that you're going to be walking in. When you throttle yourself... I don't know, I like that word. So you throttle yourself to the point where you are crucified with Christ, but nevertheless, I live, not me, but Christ lives in me, which is better than you. And then His glory will cover the earth. His glory will be seen on you. His glory will be seen on you when you learn to walk in Him. Now, you guys must like meat. Because this, this is not the baby food this morning. <laughs> Crack out your bottles and sip with me on page 33. No. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But you get your bottle out of you. No. <laughs> Glory be to God forever. His face shone like the light. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord. It is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make three tabernacles or tents, one for thee, one for Moses and Elijah. See, now Peter would have been one of those guys. Put him right up there in one of those tents and stay there for 40, you know, 4,000 years. We'll come up and visit you. We'll even bring you food. Fish sticks and marshmallows. <laughs> While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Let me ask you a question. Who's the Son of God now? Who's the child of God now? Who's the daughter of God now? Where's God going to speak to you from and say, well done, good and faithful servant? Where is he going to tell you that he's pleased from? Where are you going to hear it? Does things change? 
All of a sudden, I mean, they were this way, obviously, in Jesus' day, but now it's different in our day. Have we been talking about the cloud, entering in the cloud, learning how to discipline ourselves to enter in and stay in the cloud? What happened? God spoke out of the cloud. A voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. We'll know the powers here when you go, when we're not just laying hands on people and they're falling down was when they've already fallen down because of the power here and we lay hands on them and they stand up. That's what the prof, that's what the angel did to Daniel and some other ones. He came and they were on their face and he touched them and strength came into them and he just set them up on their feet. Or the prophets picked them up by the scruff of their neck and set them up straight. <laughs> Hallelujah. What did he say? He said, in my son, in whom I am well pleased. Do you remember what we just read? That Enoch had a testimony. Enoch lived, disciplined himself to be in that cloud. What did it say that his testimony was? That he pleased God. What pleases God then? Can you make the connection? Living and walking with him in the cloud. His world, not yours. His way, not yours. You get to change. You want to please Him? There's your rope. You know, you get to change to the point where He is everything. John said, I must decrease, He must increase. Okay. Glory be to God forever. Now, go a little farther. I don't know if I had that over there, Liv. I might. In uh Matthew 17, remember what just happened? Jesus was up on the Mount of Transfiguration. The glory of God consumed him and them. They were there. Peter and John, James, they saw Moses and Elijah standing there talking with Jesus. You know what they were talking to him about? What are they talking about? They were talking about the crucifixion that he was going to have to go through and the glory thereafter. The Bible specifically says that. How many times do you think he was there? Why do you think God manifested his glory to Jesus at that time? When he was saying, because he was saying, look at how much glory there will be for you that you can walk into if you'll pay this price. It was for the joy and the glory set before him that he endured the cross. It had to be so good. It's like you said this morning. You said, this is so good, it makes all that other junk worthwhile. I don't care about the persecution because this is so good. This glory that God is giving you becomes so good, it outweighs anything that the, the devil of the world can deal out. And you're living there and your provision's there and that is who you are. You're no longer that other person. You're this person in the glory. You walk with God. And one day, you will not be because God will take you when you have the testimony that you pleased Him. Where's the testimony come from? The cloud, the glory. I've had that to a degree. And we've had it at certain meetings where we'll sit there and we'll go right at the end of the meeting. We're just, we all have that testimony that what we just did pleased God. You ever had that? Maybe not to this degree where it's like, okay, let's just get out of here then. No, <laughs> But it's the point where you know that what you just did pleased God. That's disciplining yourself to stay there. Okay. Hallelujah. Go over there to verse 19. Remember, they just came down from the mountain. Jesus was up on the mountain. This is where it's going to hit home, people. He's coming down from the mountain. He's with... Peter, James, and John. And what do they see? Coming down from the mountain, remember Enoch. He was in the glory. He came back. What did he have to deal with? His sons and his daughters and his family. Right? Been there, done that. Yeah. And then you go back into the glory. And then you come back and you deal with something else. Look what he had to deal with. His family at this time was his disciples. <laughs> And they had a demoniac boy who had a demon. It would twist him and shake him and throw him into fires. Not good. 
No. First sign that something's wrong. (laughs) Or drown him in it, would say. And the disciples, they tried to rebuke. They tried to rebuke, but they couldn't do it. They tried to get the demon out, but they couldn't do it. Verse 19, Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And what does it say? And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting. Now, Jesus just cast out this demon. He just said it couldn't come out unless he prayed and fasted. What, did Jesus just fast from the time he was up on the mountain and came down? What, that be like a two-hour fast? No. This is telling you that the way Jesus operated, he was fasting many times in Jesus' life. Do you know he's our example? He's the one we're supposed to follow. It's part of taking up your cross. It's part of learning and disciplining and stepping into that glory and learning how to stay there. Fasting. Don't you like how I worked that into the message? (laughs) I didn't. The Holy Ghost did. So take that. Here's another piece piece of rope for you to chew on. (laughs) Don't chew on it. Put it where it's supposed to be. All right? Discipline yourself. A disciple. You could say that Enoch was the original disciple. Because his his name means to discipline. You see that? He's a type of the end time church. Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. The word take, I'll just throw this out here quickly. Primary root to take means to accept, to bring, to be carried away, to draw, to fetch, to get, to enfold. God enfolded him. He walked with God and God enfolded him in what? In himself, in the Elohim that he is. In all that he is, he was enfolded in that by walking with God. And God caught him away. Time after time after time. We don't have to stay in the mundane. We can live in the glory here and now. Until the point where God just, that's it. You're gone. And yes, you still have to deal with your kids. Well, who cares? You got power to deal with them then. Jesus said that. That's, he's, just, he's demonstrated it. You mean I gotta cast a demon out of my kid? Maybe. <laughs> Julia's like, yeah, yeah, that's what you gotta do. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that father, the father, a father of a son, begging Jesus help? Well, I'm telling you, you don't have to beg Jesus to help. You need to learn how to get into glory and be there. Stay there. Discipline yourself to stay there. Walk with God. Live there. That's, Enoch prophesying about you from the beginning. That's you. Enoch lived the prophecy of you in your life and the way it's going to be when Jesus catches you away. Put your own name in there. Hallelujah. I'm excited about it. We're going to live in this glory. God's going to speak to us out of that glory and he's going to say, this is my church. This is my son. This is my daughter and I, in whom I am well pleased. Then he's going to say, hear ye him to other people. Glory be to God forever. You want that? Does that sound good to you? This is the road we're on. Hallelujah. This is the way we're going. I've got more here, but I will either save it for next week until God tells me what to do next week. I'm learning not to try to stack too many things up in a row because, you know, he tends to just change your plans anyway. So what's the effort? Right? Let him figure it out. But we're all going to be changed. In fact, if you wanted to, I'll just, uh, I'll flip over there and read it. Just so we can end this the right way. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. You remember this whole last series we talked about what you're called to? This is what you're called to. This is, and Enoch prophesied that you would show up in the last day. 
He prophesied that you would show up and take up where he left off. And you're going to be caught up just like him. Your life is a fulfillment of his prophecy. What do you think about that? Glory be to God. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians 4. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, if you look at the life of Enoch, you would you would think that he just got caught away one time. He walked with God, you know, like walking with him, whatever that means. (laughs) And then just one day. He pleased God by making him a sandwich or something. And then he just zapped him out of his body in there, you know, or with his body, or he just took him. I like this one. (laughs) That's not the way it happened. He walked with God for 300 years. Believe me, it's not going to take us that long. We got a lot more than he had going for him. We've got salvation. We're born again. We're brand new people. We've got the Holy Ghost teaching us and training us. We've got the commandment and the prophecy to fulfillment. We've got the Bible and the roadmap of how to do it. Glory be to God forever. It's not going to take us 300 years. Then why is it taking the church so long, Angie? What's up with these people? Unbelief. Thank you. What pleases God? Faith. We got to believe it. We're believers. Do you believe you can be caught up in the spirit and live there? Yes. Then you're believers. Do you believe that you can do things there, do work there that actually has an effect on the earth? Yes, that's where we live. That's where we move. That's what we do. We abide under the shadow of the almighty whom no foe can stand. No foe, no foe. (laughs) Be the bumper sticker. No foe. Yeah, glory be to God forever. We shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, there's a lot more to that, but you know what? Let's just commit to going forward because the Spirit of God is here. He has your name, your face on his lips. All his intents for you are good. This is the direction he wants you to go. He's not going to tell you to throttle yourself and hang yourself if it isn't for your own good. (laughs) That may sound weird, but it's not. You're going to crucify those things in your life that may be slowing you down. You do it. Then he don't have to. You know, it it doesn't take much difference between what will set a balloon aloft. You ever see those hot air balloons? They're just right there at the point. They're at the point. They're at the point of takeoff. And they just throw one little sandbag out. And all of a sudden, it starts going up, lifts right up. Get at the point. Stay at the point. Just stay there. Don't get distracted by other stuff and then start throwing things out (laughs) if you're in a ship that looks like it's going down we'll throw everything out of that's what they did remember that they were throwing they were throwing their food overboard they hadn't eaten 14 days and they decided well let's lighten the load lighten the lading or what is that's what the book of acts said when they were in that storm for 14 days they just were throwing everything that had weight to it out and then they were looking at the prisoners like Hmm, how much trouble are we going to get into? Especially that beefy prisoner over there. He weighs about 250. (laughs) It'll be throwing him out because you want the boat to float lighter. You want it to stay up higher out of the water. All right, you don't need all that stuff anyway. Get rid of it. Where's your home? It's in the glory. So what do you care about all this other stuff? Just get rid of it. Slowing you down. God's got more anyway. You don't think God could just zap you into a brand new house? The brand new car? Yeah. Just like that. Zappity zing zong. What are you holding on to anyway? Just let it go. God tells you to give it away, give it away. But, 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 it's my brand new flat screen TV. I don't care. God says do it, do it. Because you're, you're disciplining yourself to do what God says. That's your future. That's your home. You're fulfilling the prophecy of Enoch. 
You should talk to people that way. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm fulfilling the prophecy of Enoch. (laughs) All right. Glory be to God. Jesus is Lord. Let's pray. Let's dedicate ourselves to what we know we need to do. You know, and I know when I when I when I'm preaching, God speaks to people. And he'll tell them stuff that they need to do and it has nothing to do with anything I said sometimes. <laughs> so just do it. Commit yourself to be obedient and to tie yourself into what God has for you. Tie yourself into that thing so you can't get out of it. <laughs> and then kick the chair out from under you. Then you've really had it. <laughs> Glory be to God forever. I believe it. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for speaking to these people today. I thank you for delivering them from problems. I thank you for cutting ropes that seems to hold them back. Right now, in Jesus' name, whatever they need to commit to do, let them commit right now in Jesus' name. We all commit right now to you and to fulfilling what you've called us to do in this brand new year. We are going to be the glorious church. We are going to live glorious lives for you where you can say, well done, and you can be pleased with everything that we have and say and do. We commit it all to you. We give you all our stuff. We give you all our our words. We give you all our time. We give you everything that you desire, and we're asking you to teach us and train us to become on the narrow way and not to forsake it in any way. And we'll give you the glory because you are so good. Holy Ghost of God in the earth today. Holy Ghost of God.